Let's wait until everybody oh, yes. has Okay, uh, our next speaker is David Khodonsky from the Institute of Mathematics of the Czech uh, Academy of Sciences, and he will tell us about games for chromatic numbers of analytic graphs. Okay, thank you. So it's very nice to be here. I, I have to say it's my first time in Gdańsk and so far I like it very much. So thanks Grigor and everyone for organizing this. I uh, very much like the conference. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about is some variation of chromatic numbers for definable graphs. Uh, also, I want to apologize to the Minster people because I already gave a talk on like basically exactly the same talk in Minster a couple of weeks ago, well, a couple of months ago. So although there I talked for like three hours, I don't think that Sandra will allow me to torture you for this long this time, because Asaf needs to get his turns after, turn after me. So, <laughs> so this is going to be a little bit condensed. Uh, right, so this uh, all this all the thing which I'll be talking about is joint work with Jindra Zapletal. And also, as you'll see, uh, also as you'll see, most of the results actually will not be new. So most of the stuff which I will actually prove or show you, well, try to convince you that we proved, has been known before. The point is that uh, we have sort of a better way how to prove these things. Uh, and uh, like uh, way how to prove these things, which is more straightforward and in some sense easier and more informative. OK, so let's start with some uh, very basic definition and very basic setup. Uh, today, during the basically during the whole, whole talk, I'll be talking about graphs. Uh, the graph will be usually called G. Uh, the underlying set, the vertex set, will be called X, and there will be an edge relation which will be called gamma. So usual graphs. Uh, but what we'll have extra is that typically X will be a Pauli space. So the underlying set is a Pauli space, and the graph is definable. So let's say that it means analytic that the uh, edge relation is an analytic subset of the product x cross x. So this is the typical setup. And we'll be interested in some sense usual things. So chromatic number. So this is just the usual definition of chromatic number. We say that chromatic number of the graph G is just the smallest cardinal kappa such that the graph, such that the vertex set can be decomposed into kappa many independent sets, so anticliques. So uh, notice there is like no definability condition here. This is just usual, usual chromatic number, no definability requirement, but it will be for a definable graph. So that's basically what we, uh, what this talk is about and what we want to determine. Uh, just some terminology. So this is perhaps more usual definition of the chromatic number. So let's say that, uh, that C, some function from the vertex set, into somewhere is a coloring of the graph if it assigns to each uh, each vertex to some color. So here uh, V is the universe. So if I'll use V, that will be the universe of sets. So a coloring will be proper if whenever two vertices are connected with an edge, they get a different value. So the usual thing. And then an equivalent definition of the chromatic number is just saying that is the smallest cardinal kappa such that there is a proper coloring with range with range kappa. Okay. So so far usual usual things nothing new. Coloring number yeah, it's a relative of the chromatic number again is this this is the usual setup. So we say that a uh, we, I will denote it as mu of the graph, mu of G. So it will be the smallest cardinal kappa, such that I can well order the vertex set, such that whenever I look at, whenever I look at an element of the vertex set X, only fewer than kappa many 
its predecessors will be connected with it with an edge. So uh, I will denote y gamma x for y being connected with the gamma uh, relation, edge relation to x. So this will be the notation I will use. So I can well order it such that everybody gets fewer than kappa many connected predecessors. So again, usual stuff. Again, no no definability requirement. This is like although the uh, the graph is definable, uh, this this coloring number there is nothing definable about it. So this this works very well for uh, for graphs which do not live on Pauli spaces or uh, anywhere. And the. Uh, well, I would say last, but maybe will be some. Will be one more. We'll see one more. So, uh, variation of the chromatic numbers. So this is called the list chromatic number, or or sometimes called the choosing number. Uh, I'm actually not sure who introduced this, but it's also one of the one of the things which people people are looking at. So a uh, list chromatic number. It sort of resembles the usual chromatic number. So what's the definition? It's the smallest cardinal kappa, such that if we give each vertex kappa many options, so kappa many possible colors, we can we are able to pick for each vertex one of these colors, such that this the result is a proper proper coloring. So it so the definition looks very similar to the definition of uh, the chromatic number. The change is that we here we don't allow each vertex to have just to be just any color like any color in kappa. We restrict the number like the, we restrict the set of options what the color can be. And so the list chromatic number is kappa if giving each vertex kappa many option is sufficient. So looks very similar to the chromatic number. And like not a difficult observation, there is a relation between these things. So the chromatic number is the smallest of uh, smaller smallest one of these. It's smaller than the list chromatic number and it's smaller than the coloring number. So the the argument here uh, arguments here are not a difficult. So Already, the definition of list chromatic number um, like is more demanding than the than the definition of chromatic number because if we give each vertex just any option in kappa, we will get the original definition of the the chromatic number. So the first one is just definition, and uh, uh, like what, what would be the usual argument for coloring coloring number implying uh, smaller. Uh, Chromatic number. We just we have the the vertices or vertices ordered. So we just go through them one by one according to the ordering, and we and each of them is connected to fewer than kappa many connected predecessors. So we just give it a different color. So that's the usual argument. And notice that exactly the same argument also works for uh, list colorings. So if we are given a list for each vertex, we go through the vertices. According to the well order we are given, we always have only fewer than kappa many colors forbidden. So we just inductively color them or we inductively choose the selector. So these yeah, these inequalities not difficult to observe. So so far things are good. Of course, now usually people get suspicious what what is what's the deal with this list chromatic number it seems to be the same thing as the chromatic number right like why is this not the why does it make sense so what what should i show you is an example of a graph which where the chromatic number is different from the list chromatic number so this is one of the uh, things which i'll do in a moment uh, right. So before that, just a, so this is the same inequality on the as on the previous slide, and just uh, like what, just what what will be going on. So in fact, we will not really be interested in what the what these numbers are. The only the, like we will be only facing the question: Is this number countable or at most countable? So we will again remember we are dealing with uh, like definable graphs on Pauli spaces. And basically, we'll only we want to decide for a given graph whether the number are, is countable or uncountable. So the here we'll 
usually be not thinking about the inequality in the sense of inequality. We will be, at least I will be thinking about it as this series of implications. So if the coloring number is countable, this means that the list chromatic number must be countable. This means that the chromatic number must be countable. So I will, I'll be talking about these implications. Right, and like typical, typical, like what should we think of? Like where, what do we want to decide about? So what are some interesting uh, definable graphs where these things are not obvious? So first example, just real line. So like Euclidean, sorry, not, not real line, uh, plane. So we have the uh, uh, R square, usual, usual metric. So just the Euclidean metric. And we can say that two things uh, do have an edge if they have a rational distance. So this is reasonably defined, it's, it's analytic, so we can ask what the chromatic number is. And this, at least I guess for most of us, it's not obvious what, whether this would be countable or uncountable. And this is known, I think it was Peter Komiad who proved this. He proved that here the coloring number is countable. So here this all works. And we will hopefully see a, like a, a simpler argument than the original one, one why this holds true. So we can think of like this of as an as an example of things think which we want to prove or which we want to which we want to figure out. Uh, another example, it looks almost the same, right? And like just not not plain, just three three dimensional Euclidean space. Again, same same edge relation. So two two nodes of the space connected with an edge if they have rational distance. Well, the result stated like this is the looks the same, that the chromatic number is countable, but this, actually the situation is sort of different. So the proof is different, and yeah, the reason for why this is true is uh, it needs to be a little bit more subtle than for the than for the plane. So al although this, this seems to be the same thing, it's not really that's the same thing. It's like one is more difficult to prove than the other, at least given the given the proof techniques which we have so far. Okay, right. And now the promised example that chromatic number is the same is not the same as the least chromatic number. Okay, there is a question. I'm. Do you want the microphone? Oh, I, I will repeat the question. Uh, yeah, so the question is about these, these examples like with plane and it's and with uh, Euclidean space. What is the metric? And yes, is the usual Euclidean metric. Does it matter if you have uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, right. So the question is uh, whether we whether we does it really matter what metric we choose? Would this work for a different metric? And sort of for the proof for plane of Komiat, that that sort of relies on uh, this really being the Euclidean metric. This kind of the argument relies on given two points and given two, again, distances from one point and the other point, there are only finitely many points which fulfill this. There are just two points on the intersection of these two circles. This this no longer works for the for the for the for the three dimensional space. They're the they're the set uh, of points which fulfill, which satisfy this is already infinite. So that's that's already the, that's actually the reason why the proof for three-dimensional space is more difficult than for just for the plane. So it does work, but it works in a different way. So yeah. So the the proof of for uh, uh, the the proof which we have for for three-dimensional space, it would work for more general metrics. You still need some some assumptions, but it would work for different metrics as long as they are like, let's say, algebraically defined. As long as you have some, uh, some, uh, um, some way how to write and how to compute the some algebraic way how to compute what the edge is or what what the metric is. Okay. Yes. Now more, more questions. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so what I meant to say is the, the chromatic number is omega. We will see that actually the coloring number is omega. And this and this is what and this is what fails. I think I'm not sure if Komiat, but this I think Komiat showed that this fails for the for the three-dimensional space. 
that there that there are things that the coloring number is no longer omega. So that's that's one thing which is different for the for the uh, for the three dimensional space than the plane. And okay, I'm also. Uh, yeah, I have to tell you, I'm like about all these results. I'm not that confident. I'm that that what I'm telling you is completely true. So, the disadvantage of of that talk being recorded is that anybody can watch it and then see what nonsense I was telling you. So, anyway, I, I yeah, I think what I told you is true, but you should verify. Okay. Right. Example: chromatic. Uh, what is it? List chromatic number being different than uh, than chromatic number, right? And this uh, example will be important later in the talk. So uh, this is just even if you believe that these two things can be different, still please do listen to watch what this example is because we will be using it again later. So let's de uh, uh, let's define this graph delta. And delta will be a graph which consists of two parts. Maybe I'll just quickly draw it. So the first part is just the binary tree. So, so binary tree and nodes of the binary tree. And the second part uh, are the branches of the binary tree. So we have this. So these are the branches. So the first part is countable. The second part is of size continuum. And what is the graph? What is the edge relation? Uh, we say that uh, we will only be connecting points or vertices in the countable part with vertices in the uncountable part in the uh, part of size continuum, and we will always connect uh, all the nodes which belong to a branch to the branch. And nothing else. So, so if this branch goes here, then uh, uh, this is just like this one, one branch. So it's a bipartite graph. Uh, it's a bipartite graph. So the particular, the uh, chromatic number is two. Of course, now I'm already cheating you because I promised that that the graphs will be Pauli spaces. This, I mean, almost looks like a Pauli space, but I didn't tell you what the topology is. So. This is right now. This is just a graph without topology. But yeah, it would not be that difficult to put a top Polish topology on it. But this could be done in multiple ways. Anyway, let's leave that leave that leave that for later. So it's a bipartite graph. So the chromatic number is two. On the other hand, the uh, list chromatic number is uncountable. Right. So, and let's try to see the reason. Let's try to do the proof. So first we need to sh to use that we have this. Uh, uh, that we have this continuum many branches. So choo just choose some bijection E between the uh, between the branches and all possible colorings by nat by uh, natural numbers of the countable part of the graph. So this will be the set. This is the set of all functions G. So for color, all colorings of the nodes of the binary tree by omega many colors. And just to make things tidier, let's say that we demand that the value of the, the coloring on any given node T is something greater than the length of the node. So we are not really looking at all possible colorings. We are looking just at these colorings which fulfill this requirement. So this is just a set of size continuum. So just choose a bijection, put a bijection there and fix it, denote it E. Now we should come up with a list coloring for which we cannot pick a proper selector. So what will be the list? So for a node in the binary tree, so for T, let the list will be just all the natural numbers which are greater than the length of T. So we allow it to have any color as long as the color as the number is bigger than the length of T. So that's for each T, that's, this is a countable list, so it's size omega, so that's fine. And for 
x for a branch in the binary tree, <clears throat> we also should create a list. So the list will be, we look at the function g, which corresponds to the, to the branch in this bijection. And we look at all the uh, initial segments of the branch. And we check what the, for the function assigned to x, what it what color it gave to the node t so to the restriction again here we should verify that this is a countable set that this is infinite set here is where we are using that we want g of t to be uh, bigger than the than the size of t so we are still along we still definitely have infinitely many allowed colors for uh, for x so this so this function l that's a reasonable list assignment of course we want to show that this doesn't have a proper l selector so suppose that c is an l selector so selector from this list now look just forget what the what the uh, what it does on the uh, on the branches just take a restriction on the on the binary tree this is one of the functions here in this set. So this has some x, some branch assigned. So there is x such that the col this, this coloring, the c, is exactly e of x. Uh, of course, now things go wrong. So uh, cx is something on the list. So there is some n such that c of x is actually the it comes from this t. T is the x restric restricted to n. So it's this exactly. Uh, so it's e of x in in this x restricted to n, but that's by definition exactly c of in that node. And of course, c restriction n is connected to x. So c of x gets the same color as c restricted c of x restricted to n. So two things connected with an edge got the same color. Yeah, uh, that's it. C is not proper. So just, yeah, just using the, we are using the bijection and using the definition. So this thing doesn't have countable uh, list chromatic number. So this is our counterexample. Okay, and we will be we will be re reusing this uh, this graph later. So just remember the graph and graph without countable list chromatic number, but with fine, even finite chromatic number. OK. Right, and now the promised topology. So there are multiple ways how to put a topology on that on the delta. So first, let's choose delta. So uh, sorry, zero. So delta zero. So this will be just the, sa the same graph, but now the delta will have a Polish topology. So because the branches is just the counter space. The binary tree consists of isolated points and the space is like a topological sum of these two sets. So this is saying that all the all the nodes in the binary tree is a closed set of isolated points. So nothing from the from the binary tree converge converges any, anywhere. These are just isolated point points and you cannot converge anywhere out of there. So that's delta zero. So it's a poly space. And the, the way how we define the graph relation, again, it's not difficult to verify that this is analytic, that this is nice, nicely defined. And why is this useful? So this is actually a theorem with which uh, Yindra Zapletal and Francis Adams proved uh, already some time ago in a, in a paper. They used sort of, uh, the for them this, this uh, theorem was a side product of considering some uh, like forcing with uh, with, I'm not sure if cliques or anti cliques of definable graphs, and they were looking at when does this, what kind of real do, reals does this add, and this was as, like this theorem was, was one of the corollaries which they got there. So what does the theorem say? So suppose that we have a, a graph on a poly space and the edge relation is analytic. Then one of the following, uh, one of the two options hold. Either delta zero can be continuously embedded into G. Uh, what does it mean that, that there is like a continuous one-to-one -one function from delta from like from the from the underlying space 
into X, which preserves the graph relation. So this is, the, for example, this is fulfilled if if G is like the complete graph on a Pauli space, then this 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 would be the option. Like on a uh, let's say complete graph on a you know, set of isolated points, then this would be this would be true. Or the coloring number is countable. So one of these has, has to hold. So in particular, what does this say? So if uh, if the coloring number is uncountable, then it must be the case that delta zero is embedded into G. So the only reason, or like if something doesn't have countable coloring number, it already must have this delta embedded, and the delta is embedded even with like with this uh, topologically with this topology. And notice that this is a dichotomy that these two like this says that for each uh, graph exactly one of these holds true because of course they cannot hold simultaneously if the coloring number should be countable then delta cannot be embedded because as we saw delta has uncountable list chromatic number so it must have also uncountable coloring number so this is a dichotomy for uh, for definable graphs okay and yeah why, why i'm calling it theorem zero is just that the zero matches this zero no, no other reason there okay and seemingly unrelated thing but i promised you games in uh, games in the title so let's define a game for uh, so this is a game and imagine that again we have x a uh, Poly space gamma and analytic edge relation on on some graph. Imagine it's a graph from this theorem. So it's a the usual thing: game of two players going on in omega many rounds. And what do they play? In each round, player one plays a point in the in the space, and he also plays an basic open set. And he and also he's the set which he's playing. Their diameters are getting smaller. So let's say that in uh, that in the round n uh, that in round n the diameter of the set which he plays must be smaller than two to minus n or something like that. Just that just we want to have some con we want to make sure that these things uh, are getting smaller. Also, you maybe you noticed I'm sort of cheating. I said poly space, but now I'm talking about diameters. So we formally should choose also some compatible metric, but it wouldn't really matter. So let's just pretend that we have some compatible metric chosen. OK, so that's what the first player does. What the second player does, he just he's just choosing points. So in round in round in round n, he player two just chooses point y n. So that's how the game goes. And what are the rules? What does player one want to achieve? So player one will win. First of all, he is never allowed to play the well, like one point twice. He always have to play different points. So for n different than m, x n must be different than x m. Uh, second of all, so he wants the set of open sets which he plays to be nested. So in fact, what he's doing, he's trying to to converge to some to some point with these sets B n. So he's trying to choose some point with uh, with playing smaller and smaller neighborhoods of these points. So B n, the closure of B n plus one must be contained in B n. And also, what player two is doing, in fact, he is forbidding player one to converge to Y n. So. The rule is that y n, the player which player two, uh, the, the the point which player two forbid, is not allowed to be in the closure of b n plus one. So if player two played some point, from the next round on, player one, the neighborhood, the, the open sets which he plays, they are they have to be far from this point which player two forbid. And the last last rule, so. Player one is playing some nested sy system of open sets. So they converge to some point. So they have some intersection. So let's call the intersection Z. So this Z is some uh, some element of the poly space. Player one wants all the points, with all the XNs which he played, he does want it to be edge connected with an edge to the limit, to the point Z, which he was also guessing through the game. 
So player, so the result of the game, if player one won, is that he played some sequence of points, and he was also getting some. He was also guessing some point Z by playing its neighborhoods, and he wants each of each of these X ends in the sequence to be connected to this point Z, which he guessed. And what player two is doing, he's just forbidding him what the limit is, what what kind of uh, what point he is he allowed to get as a limit. Okay, so that's just a, that's just a game of two players on this graph. And as everybody should be asking now, so what about determinacy of this game and so on? Right. So this is where our theorem comes. Comes. So it's a better version of this theorem zero. So let's call it theorem zero plus. And it's a better version of the theorem zero. So it says three things. So this this the same setup. We have a Polish. Uh, we have a graph which is analytic on a Polish space. So the game G zero is determined for this for this graph. So indeed, this graph this game is determined. And player one having winning, stra winning strategy is the same as delta zero being embedded. So that's the first that's the first uh, first option in this dichotomy. And player two has winning strategy if and only if the coloring number is at most countable. So it's a so it's like an improved version of the dichotomy that tells us that it has to do with some game being determined. And yeah, so what is uh, what is the real purpose of this theorem? Why this theorem is uh, is useful? Uh, the interesting implication is here the implication from player two having a winning strategy into coloring number being countable. That that what is really going on. That's the interesting part because this gives us a tool how to how to verify that certain graph has countable coloring number. So instead of like doing some method, whatever that is, we can just figure out how uh, for uh, how player two can win this game and we are done. We, this already gives us a countable coloring number. So the, the, like the, the real crux of this theorem is this, this, this tool for verifying of countable coloring number. Just win a game and your graph must have countable coloring number. Okay. So, uh, I, yeah, the plan now is to sketch you the key arguments of this uh, of this proof. Of course, I will not be able to go uh, very very much into details, but I'll just give you some like hints or just some idea how does this what does this theorem rely on. There is a question. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the question is whether there is any like uh, in in the game what, where do we like if we want something the, about the points x n if they have to be played in the balls or something, and the answer is no. In this version of the game, the the, the points are just anywhere, just points into space. Uh, yeah. So so there is so I will not rephrase the question exactly because. Uh, given enough time, we will actually see the like where this where this goes, and we will there will be another game which does exactly this the stuff where you have some uh, have some requirement that you are putting the points in the ball. In fact, it will be sort of simpler. It will turn out that there is a simpler game which is much simpler to 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 formulate, and in some sense, some sense is better, but in some sense is worse. So we'll see that uh, in yeah, we should see that in like ten maybe twenty minutes. Okay. Right. So, how to prove how to prove this uh, this theorem is the game. That the, so let's why the game is determined. How uh, what, how should we proceed to prove that the uh, that the this when the how to use the uh, the fact that the relation is analytic to get determinacy. So, if the game uh, if the relation is analytic, this means that it's an image of a bear space. And we will not really be using that the edge relation is an image of a bare space. We will do this. We will be looking at the set of all sequences of X ends plus one extra point Z, which have the property that all X ends are connected to the to the point Z. So this would be like uh, 
if you are thinking about the game, these are all possible sequences uh, and plus the result of the game, which player one wants to play, so which he wants to get. So this is some subset of the of the space X to omega plus one, so om omega sequence plus the last point Z, such that yeah, uh, such that the last point is connected to all all of the uh, previous ones. So again, not that difficult to see. This is analytic set. It's an analytic set. So it is an image of the of a uh, of a bare space via some con some continuous function. Let's call it k and fix the k. So now when we have the fixed function k, we will define we define an unraveled version of the game. So let's call it this G zero U is unraveled and it will be a modification. It will be the same game. We will only make it a little bit more difficult for player one to play. So the rules are the same. Everybody has to do the same stuff, but we will add one extra thing which player one has to do. So Player one, moreover, in the nth round of the game, he will have to play a set Tn. So this will be a sequence of natural numbers of length n. Yeah, what I forgot to write uh, forgot to write there is that they uh, his uh, his sequences have to extend each other. So I'll write it here. So for each n, we need to have the Tn is an initial segment of t n plus one. So he's so what what player one is doing. Moreover, he's also guessing a, he's guessing a branch through the uh, an he's guessing an element of the bare space con in a continuous way. Uh, we can say that in the n n round he plays the initial segment of the of the of the uh, branch of like Franklin. So he's guessing this uh, this branch, and what he's supposed to do, he's supposed to guess guess the pre-image of the sequence which he actually plays played. So we add one extra requirement for for player one. We want that we we look at this branch in the or in, in the element of the bare space which he played, and the image via key k of this of this set, it has to be exactly the sequence which he played. So this is an extra requirement. If he fulfills this, then he of course achieves that all the XNs are connected to Z. So this he gets for free if he achieves, if he achieves this. So it's so we are making the, the game more difficult for player one by having him to, to also guess what the result of the game actually is. OK, so this is an, some other game, unraveled version of the game. Obviously, it's more difficult for player one to play. Then this uh, this version of the game is already uh, closed for player one. So in fact, if he if player one lost this game, he must have been lost already after some finite number of uh, num number of uh, of rounds. So yeah, I will not go in detail into this, but this, yeah, it's not, not, nothing difficult. Just look at the definition of the game. If he went wrong, then he must have wrong already and some final uh, some step of the game and there was no way for him to save it. So yeah, so it's a closed game, therefore determined. So certainly this unraveled game is determined. Yeah, and now uh, probably as you would have expected, the game is already equivalent with the original one. So if player one has a winning strategy in the more difficult game, in the unraveled game, he has a winning strategy in the original game. So yeah, this is this is obvious. On the other hand, if player two has a winning strategy in the unraveled game, he can create out of it a winning strategy in the original game. So this is a little bit more difficult to argue, but again, not that difficult because in in this in this unraveled version of the game, player one was not giving him that much extra information. There, are, at each step, there are only countably many things. The end, which player one could have additionally played, uh, like in contrast to the original game. So there is, so he is not giving him that huge advantage. So yeah, and the yeah, the game is simple enough, so that if player two wants to play some point y n, he can sort of play it later and achieve the same 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 effect. So this roughly is the argument why this is in fact not more difficult. Like this is not easier for, for player two than the original one. Okay, so the unraveled game is is equivalent with the original game. So 
we are done. So that's one proved. Okay, as for as for two, yeah, this is this is how it goes. I'll yeah, I'll try to do hand waving with the with the blackboard. So uh, I'll just quickly tell you what the idea is. I won't be pretending that it's much of a proof. Uh, so first, suppose that uh, that we uh, that we know that the space delta zero is embedded. So in fact, we can. So when player one wants to win the game, he can just focus on the space delta zero and pretend that he's playing on the space delta zero. So this is the space delta zero. And the strategy which he will use is that he will be playing points along some branch that will be the points xn. The basic open neighborhoods he will be playing somewhere here. So he will be trying to converge to the like to where the branch actually is. And yeah. And when player two give him some point, if the point is here, he just makes sure that the branch goes elsewhere and the set which he plays is different. So yeah, just he just needs to win the uh, the game at the delta zero space. He'll be playing these X ends on the branches and the Z. With the Z, he aims to be the result of the branch on which he is playing the points. So that's the rough idea for one implication. And the other implication is yeah, this would be even more hand waving. So uh, yeah, so suppose that we have a winning strategy for player one and we want to create out of it an image of delta zero. So basically the uh, the uh, player two will be looking at the strategy and playing against the strategy and some and quite often when he when he makes player one to play some point he will declare the point to be some element of the binary tree so out of the out of the possible replies of player one he will create the, the binary tree and the uh, and this copy of the counter space that would be the possible sets of those Z's, which are the results of the game which, uh, if player one won. So this is like very rough idea how this how this proof goes. And yeah, and there is not like not much beyond this. There's nothing more in going there. Okay, so that's sort of the not so interesting equivalence. Yeah, so that was this uh, proof of three. So First, there are two implications. First, the not interesting one is if we have countable coloring number, then there is no way how the space delta could be embedded because that would that would make the uh, coloring number to be uncountable. So in part particular, we can use what we proved already. So if delta, delta zero is not embedded, player one cannot have a winning strategy. Game is determined, player two has a winning strategy. We are done. So that's this implication. So what is really going on is this. So we are given a strategy for the player two, and we should cook up out of it some argument for countable countable coloring number. So that's sort of the heart of the heart of the theorem. Again, I will try to sketch the main arguments of the proof and yeah, we'll see. So, lemma. Suppose that we are given a subset uh, B of the space X, which is, uh, yeah, right. Suppose that we are given a strategy sigma, which is winning for, for player two. And now suppose that we are given a subset B of the space X, which is close with respect to sigma. Uh, what does it mean being close with respect to sigma? I'll just go back to what the game is. So let's, uh, let's look at this version of the game. So meaning that as for a set being close with respect to strategy sigma means that as long as player one keeps playing points X in set B, he does not provoke the strategy to play a point Y outside of the set B. So as long as player one plays points in B, strategy also replies in B. So this 
this would mean close disrespect to the strategy sigma. Notice that the, they are playing basic open neighborhood, so, so here are only countably many options which player one can additionally play. So like in particular, every set has a superset of the same cardinality, as long as it's infinite, which is close to respect to the strategy. OK, so suppose that we have a set like this. So B. Then, if Z is any point of the space which is not in the set, it can be connected with at most finitely many points in the set B. So if we have a set close with respect to the strategy, no point outside can have many edges which go into this set. Uh, why is this true? Suppose we get a set where this fails. So we have a set. The strategy doesn't provoke player one to go out, go out of it, and uh, it should be winning for for player two. But now, what what player what player one can do? How can player one beat the strategy? So he will just keep playing in the set B, and he will sorry. Suppose that there are infinitely many points in this set which are connected to Z. So let's enumerate them, x0, x1, x2, and so on. And player one will just keep playing these points, and he will be play, He will be aiming for this point Z with these basic open sets B, which he's playing. He can do this because the, the set is close with respect to the strategy. So in particular, the strategy will never reply Z as one of those Y ends. So player one can do this, so he can place this X axis, which would be in this infinite set and aim for Z. So the strategy is not winning. OK, so if B is closed, there are not many edges going out of it. Second lemma. Suppose that we have a set which is close to respect to the subset of X, close to respect to the strategy. Then we can look at it as a like subgraph. So we only look at the subgraph at this set. This will have a countable coloring number. This, of course, implies the theorem. So this, we can use this for for the for the whole space X, and this is what we want to prove. So why I'm stating it like this? We want to. We will be proving this lemma by induction on the uh, on the size of the set B. So we will be proving this for infinite closed uh, uh, infinite subsets of X, which are closest with respect to the strategy. By induction on the size of the set, we will prove that. Already, the graph has countable coloring number. So if B is of size omega, this works. Just order it of type omega. This each point has only finitely many predecessors. So, in particular, it has at most finitely many connected predecessors. We are fine. So, suppose that B is larger. It's closed with respect to the strategy. I will be writing it as sigma closed, although this is not a very not a very good notation, let me use that. So suppose that B is closed, and for all sets of smaller cardinality, the lemma holds. So we can write B as a countable increasing unions of smaller sets, smaller meaning sets of smaller cardinality, strictly smaller cardinality, cardinality which are closed with respect to the strategy. So by, induct, uh, by the induction hypothesis, we will get on each of them this well order. Remember what we are proving. We want to prove that there is a well order such that everybody is connected to only finitely many predecessors. Right, so the induction hypothesis gives us that we can decompose B in this continue, as a continuous increasing union. And for each element of this union, we already have this order. So we define an order well order on B out of this. So we can we call this amalgamation and it's sort of simple. So if X comes in the continuous increasing union earlier than Y, then we just say that X is before Y. And in case X and Y come at the same time, so they can they come at the same B alpha plus one, then we just they just inherit the order which they got by this induction hypothesis. Uh, remember, this is a continue, continuous increasing union, so no points are coming in on limit steps. So everybody comes at some stage 
and either and so he he put him behind all the points which came before him and the points which came which came at the same time they had just inherit the, the order from the induction hypothesis and yeah of course the claim is that this is the this is the well order which you are searching for and could be to see that let's so let's take some point y into set b so y came in at some b alpha plus one in the in the uh, increasing union so now the set of of his predecessors which are connected are either those which came earlier so that this set this set is finite because of this lemma it's exactly this lemma so this set is finite because b alpha was closed with respect to the strategy and these points so those are points which came at the same stage but where bef how, how did they get before y in the final well order because they were before y in the alpha alpha plus first like at the stage where they came and this is finite by the induction hypothesis so this set is finite this set is finite so the union is finite and that's what we were to prove so that's a that's a well order on the set b which works and now of course we use b equals x and the theorem is proved okay so that's uh, that's the theorem so just quickly some some corollaries uh, this actually is not like this corollary it's not we don't need the game for it. This is already corollary of the previous theorem. I just didn't have enough space on the previous, like on the slide, to to write it there. So notice that uh, already this theorem implies that for analytic graphs having coloring number and uh, list chromatic number countable is the same. Of course, one direction is just the implication that the coloring number is uh, is bigger than the than the list chromatic number. The other direction, the implication is, well, if the coloring number is uncountable, then we can embed delta zero. If we can embed delta, delta zero, then like at the beginning, we saw that delta zero already has uncountable least chromatic number. So the space needs to have uncountable least chromatic number. So this is already, so for analytic graphs, these two things are already equivalent, but we, the game we didn't really need for this okay and now sort of the uh, like one promised example let's say that we have the plane and we would like to see that the plane has countable coloring number so what so how to prove this at this point we can just argue that player two wins the the game uh, so let's maybe just Uh, let me give a quick quick strategy for player two in the game in the plane. So what does suppose that they are the two players are, are are playing and player two wants to beat player one. So what does player one want to do? He's playing a sequence of points and he wants to find uh, and wants to, to to also to approximate one uh, one extra point in the plane which has rational distance from all of them. And player two can forbid him some points from being the result. So what does player two do in the game? So first he lets player one play his first two points and without really caring what, 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 what's going on. So player one plays, plays x0 and then he plays x1. And what does player one need to do in order to win? He needs to converge with these b ends to some point which have rational distances from both x0, x1. But there are only countably many points in the point in the plane which have rational distances from both of these points. Like for each pair of rational numbers, there are only two points which are in this in these distances with respect to x0, x1. So, yeah, so we has just there is just countable list of points which can get player one as z so that he wins. So what will player two be doing? He'll just list all these points and he will be playing them as his replies as as his y ends well what's the result z cannot be any of those points so z can the, the resulting point cannot have a rational distance from both x0 and x1 player to one so that's a winning strategy 
Okay, so that's so that's basically it. we now we have the proof of this theorem of Comiat that this this graph has countable coloring number. Right, and uh, yeah, let me just okay. I, I, I in the beginning, I well, let me get it. At some point, I promised I will show like I'll show you what's going on if the x ends are in the balls. So let me just uh, yeah, let me just say that there is this other game. The other game is simpler. So player uh, player one is playing only points, nothing else. Player two is again playing only points, nothing else. And what player one wants to achieve is that he wants the points to form to form a converging sequence. The limit of the sequence should be connected to all of them. And the limit is not allowed to be any of those those points which player two played. So this is sort of like a different version of the of the game. It's sort of simpler. Now basically player one has to converge to the to the point with with these with these points x ends. Otherwise it's the same. And there is this other version of the theorem. So again the same setup. This game is this version of the game is again determined. And we have again sort of a dichotomy, only sort of. So Either player one has a winning, uh, so player one has a winning strategy. If and only if we can embed this time delta zero, uh, sorry delta one instead of delta zero. What is delta one? Delta one is the sort of the same space, only the topology is different. In this case, we make the nodes uh, on the branch to converge to the branch. Uh, right. So either player one has a winning strategy. And this is if and only if we can embed again delta with some other topology continuously. Or if player two has a winning strategy, then G is left separated. Uh, sorry, I didn't tell you what is left separated. Let's say left separated is a property which is between countable coloring number and countable chromatic number. So sort of this is a uh, yeah, so sort of this is a weaker conclusion. And Again, the down. Yeah, this is not a dichotomy. Uh, unfortunately, like there are spaces, for example, delta one, which fulfills both two and three. But again, the most useful takeaway from this theorem is this implication because it sort of, uh, again, it gives us a tool how to prove that graphs do have countable coloring number. So, for example, for this three-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, demonstrating that two wins this game is already sufficient or is good enough for showing countable chromatic number of the graph. OK, and I yeah, well, I'm not over time yet, but almost. Thanks. So we have two minutes for questions. Are there any questions for David? John, yeah. Uh, okay, so the question is whether uh, there is any connection with these dichotomies which we have with uh, with Kechrich, Kechrich, Solecki, Todorcevic dichotomy. And the answer is, I don't know, I have no idea. But thanks for the question. Uh, okay, so then uh, there's a, coffee, a short coffee break with just 15 minutes. And before that, we thank our speaker again. Thank you.